Tony Ehrenreich, uh, renowned in certain areas, but when I look at your uh, CV here, Councillor, National Deputy General Secretary of Kasatu, Provincial Secretary Kasatu, Leader of the Opposition Cape Town City Council, and you were started off life, I suppose, in the business world as a mechanic. Now that surprised me because you also went to UCT. Where did the politics come from? Well, I'm a mechanic because my father's a mechanic, so that's the trade that I went to also. I worked on sea when I finished school. I never went to university after school. I did one or two courses at university, but I'm not a university graduate in that extent. Uh, politics came from school. I was in the 76 protests in 1980. I was a student leader, part of the committee of 81 that people like Ibrahim Rasul, Ibrahim Patel, and many others were part of. Uh, school politics in the Western Cape linked to the 90s, 80s. So that's where I initially got involved in politics. But my parents, uh, while they weren't active in the UDF or the ANC, always had a strong aversion against apartheid. And that was the discussion in our family. That was the discussion that happened uh, at social events in my, certainly my family circles. There were many people in that era uh, uh, that we talk about, the 70s and the 80s, that aligned themselves with the Nationalist Party, many coloured people. They, they felt more aligned to the whites than they did to the ANC. Why did yours take a different path? Well, I think that people who stood on the side of justice couldn't align themselves to the National Party. I have an immense regard for my father because while a lot of businessmen was taking money from what was then known as the Coloured Development Corporation. My father refused their money. And he battled along. He had his own little uh, workshop uh, business that he ran for many years. My mother did the books, he did the mechanical work, and he employed a few guys. But even though he had hard times, he refused to take money from them. And that's admirable because many coloured leaders, so-called, who are today in prominent positions, are those who took money. The Swatzers are an example, and many others. Uh, they took money from the Colored Development Corporation and enriched themselves, really, in an illegitimate system. But my parents had principles and values, mm -hmm. and they were not going to support any separate development program that was driven by the apartheid government. How do you feel about today? You're talking about people enriching themselves, and I think you know where I'm going to come to now. There are many people who've come to power that have enriched themselves under this government. Of course, that's the great tragedy of the ANC. It's an incredible organization that fought a noble battle against apartheid, and many talented and prominent leaders arose out of that, people who would have laid down their lives for their people, in service of their people. As soon as they got to power, they seek to enrich themselves at the cost of their people. The kind of corrupt practices that we've seen in many areas has taken money out of service delivery or out of things that we should have done. But much more than that, it's undermined the psyche of our nation. It's undermined our people's ability that we can do things different as an African country. And so many of those who have enriched themselves as part of the systemic change, they've done us a great disservice. But the change from apartheid to a <coughs> democratic South Africa was always uh, going to be bedeviled by these things because it was an elitist compromise. It was a deal done between the elites of the ANC, the political elites in this country, and the elites of apartheid. And so it was always going to be fraught with sellouts. You talk about a democratic South Africa, yet isn't that really in contradiction to socialism and Kasatu? No, democracy is important. We've built one man, but one vote. But what kind of democracy are you? Absolutely. But we have institutions of democracy. We have one man, one vote. We have the franchise extended to everyone. That's an incredible advance from where we were under apartheid. So nobody should take that away from South Africa as an immense achievement. But that was always just meant to be the foundation for undoing the legacy of apartheid and building the kind of society where everyone had the same opportunities. Mm. What's happened has denied uh, that, <coughs> that prospect. And sure, Kusato talks about mm. socialism in the sense that it's got to be a more equitable, more fair, more just distribution of the incredible wealth of our country. And that certainly hasn't happened. I'd like to explore that avenue of socialism and use a comparison as well at the same time, if you don't mind. And we look at socialism as the Labour Party in the United Kingdom. We look at democracy as probably most white people or most people in the world would call Westminster style democracy or American style democracy, as opposed to what we often hear now is African democracy. What is the, what is the difference between the two? What do you see African democracy as 
as opposed to those other sets of principles? I think the fundamental question for me in democracy is that it's got to have one man, one vote. You've got to have within the institution the ability to change parties, to change leadership, and to have democratic organizations who are able to adopt policies and change their own leadership. And even though you may lose an election or you may lose a battle for leadership in the organization, the democratic space means that you can always contest again with different ideas. That's when that space is denied. So that's an important thing. But it's about what do we do with the democracy, what happens in the democracy. The, the vote in itself, we're now discovering, means very little. You've got to ensure that you're able to deliver the fruits of a democratic society, which means that you've got to respond to the needs of all of its people. Apartheid was a system of accumulation, but it meant that it was the accumulation of white people, the wealth accumulated under white people, but with systemic support from the state. The state had to intervene after apartheid to make sure that we undo the legacy, we undo the disadvantage, the generational disadvantages of apartheid, and we make sure that everybody has the opportunity to be able to be prosperous and to function in the society as normal. The difficulty for South Africa in its transition from the apartheid state to a democratic state that responds to the needs of all of its people has been what's happened in the economy. Now, as part of the deal in 1994, we also signed on to the policy that generally referred to as GEAR, the Growth, Employment and Redistribution Policy. Essentially what that meant in, with the 1994 changes and the adoption of the institution and the adoption of the Bill of Rights, we really entrenched the ownership patterns of apartheid. So the mines wouldn't be touched, the farms wouldn't be touched, people who stole land under apartheid wouldn't be touched. The white privilege was essentially defended by the institutions of the state and the kind of democracy we built. So the state was meant to play a role in undoing the legacy of apartheid. Because in the marketplace, the, or in a market economy, the argument is that everything's equal, so everyone has the chance to compete and achieve their objectives. Well, if you've just come out of apartheid, everything's certainly not equal, because black people are at an incredible disadvantage. Who's going to undo that disadvantage? It's got to be the state. The state acting in pursuance of the promises of the Constitution. The state may have entrenched many of those noble ideals, but the state and the governing party didn't want to move towards that. So after 1996, when we spoke about, and the Freedom Charter is many of the cornerstones of what we were meant to put in place, and it's in captured in many of the key chapters of the, con of the Constitution. But after that, we adopted GEAR, and GEAR essentially said that we're sending a signal to the international investors that we're not going to tamper with the ownership as it is. Farms would stay where they are, mines would stay where they are. There'd be no changes. But that meant that the ownership patterns, that the apartheid generational disadvantages would stay as it is. And if we look 20 years later at the consequence of that policy, what do we see? We see the unemployment levels are higher. We see the levels of inequality is worse than it was in 1994. And there are deepening levels of poverty. And this is in spite of us having an incredible program of rolling out houses, water, electricity, and many other things. But we failed in being able to change the ownership patterns of the economy and the resultant relations between people. So it, there's still a bass and class relation in South Africa. Doesn't that all boil down to an educational system whereby it's all very well taking things away that are working and giving them to somebody who is not educationally responsible or able to keep those things working. Doesn't it really boil down to that as being partially to blame? Well, nobody's suggesting for a moment that you must take it away. What you must do is nearly enforce partnerships. Why can't farmers and farm workers be partners in what happens at the farm? So that the farmers by law have equity, the farm workers by law have equity in the farm, let's say, 45 or 50 percent, and they're forced to work with a farmer to make it a viable operation and for them to get the skills. Because it's a misnomer to say that farm, farm workers have not been running the farms. The government has spent so much money in developing new cultivars, in research and development. The farm owner does very little. In South Africa, we have a lot of corporate farms. There's very little intrinsic historical knowledge that goes to farming.